Brett Fuhrman. I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been working in Manhattan since 1987. And it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. The work is not done here, but this is a major, major step forward. My reaction is, uh, this is nuts. It's really, really crazy. You never know, yeah, you, you never know who your neighbors are, right? Hello Grizzlies and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizzela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and today we have a very special guest that's joining us, Joe Jackalone. I'll bring up, uh, him up in a moment. I just quickly want to say thank you so much PT Nottaman for your sticker. It's so nice to see you back in chat for Fury and Willow. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. So if you haven't yet, please like and share this uh, so that we can call some people over because we want to introduce them to Joe Jackalone and here he is with us. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, G. Good to see you. Yes, and if the Grizzlies have not met you yet, can you please tell them a little bit about yourself? Sure, I spent uh, over 20 years in the New York City Police Department. One of the jobs that I had, I was the former commanding officer of the Bronx Cold Case Squad. And I was one of three supervisors that cover, covered five counties of New York City, right? A lot of people just think New York City is just Manhattan, but it's Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx. And I worked up in the Bronx, but, you know, I had to do duties in Queens and uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan cases. So it was a kind of um, a lot of work in certain respects, but it was definitely the best job that I had because you actually felt that you could make an impact with families when you're dealing with cases who basically thought they were forgotten. Uh, I've been an adjunct professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice for this, I just started my 19th year, and I've written two books. One is The Criminal Investigative Function, A Guide for New Investigators, which is the fourth edition now. And the new book that just came out uh, about mid-year last year is The Cold Case Handbook, which was a book that I wrote not only for law enforcement, but also for the true crime community and family members as well. So there's a lot of things in there for all the people who are interested in cold cases and how they can use this to help try to push these cases forward. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. And Forensic Fury says, G sent us to Joe's channel and no regrets. What an education. <laughs> <laughs> we love your uh, community posts, your polls and quizzes that you put up there. I learned so much from them as well. So if you guys haven't checked out Joe's channel yet, Joseph Jackalone, is, this is the channel name. Nightbot will be sharing it. The mods will also be sharing it. Thank you, mods, for everything you do. And sorry if I'm not saying, guys, welcome to all my members, patrons, subscribers, and everyone. If you are a patron, remember we're having a Patreon-only live stream later, and you got to check your uh, Patreon notifications for that, okay? So, <laughs> mods, yes, if you could share the link, I see people are asking. This is Joe's channel. Go subscribe over there, okay? Show some grizzly love. Um, I love it over there, so I'm sure that you guys will as well. And then this is your website, which also tells us more about you because you're very humble <laughs> there's a lot that you've done in your life and a lot that you continue to do and as you said you're also a professor at the john jay college of criminal justice and there's even your facebook page here so you guys have a yep. lot of homework okay <laughs> go and click go follow go share go get the book and everything all right beverly thank you so much so you guys if you do have questions uh, about the gilgo beach case that we'll be discussing you can also ask in chat I will be sure to check, you know, I'm trying to manage everything at once, talking to Joe, looking at you guys, what you're saying. <laughs> but I do also have questions. We're going to pick your brain today. <laughs> sure. I know you've Let's talked about this case quite a bit. You've done quite the deep dive on this case for a long time. So when did you first follow the case? Did you hear about it when it happened, like when the bodies were discovered in 2010 or when? Yeah. So what happens is I was still working in the police department when this case finally broke. And initially we were uh, asked, uh, you know, NYPD with the cold cases, if we had any cases that might be similar, you know, these are the things that happen, right? So anytime something happens either on a county that we border, like for instance, Yonkers up in the Bronx or Westchester, you know, if you had cases that have similar types of MOs, uh, you're always asked to see, hey, listen, can you do a dive into, 
you know, cases that might have similar patterns, right? Because one thing about cold cases is you always look to see if there is another companion case. And the reason for that is because it might actually hold the keys or the answers to the one you're working on. So initially we had, we had gotten the phone call to start looking at cases that might have a certain pattern. But unfortunately, we had many cases that had, uh, you know, sex workers that were involved in in these kind of cases. And, you know, to try to pinpoint a specific event, a specific person, it, it's really difficult in that respect. So, you know, like everything else, we give out the list of the cases that we have and and to see exactly what, what was transpiring. And plus, it was like literally in my backyard. At the time, I was living in a town called Wantaw, which is called the, the gateway to Jones Beach. And Jones Beach is where, you know, some of the remains were found a little bit later on. It's in Nassau County for those that might not be aware of. And when you go down the, the Wantaw State Parkway right at the Jones Beach, it's about three and a half miles uh, trip. And then what happens is you, you, you have to either go left or right. If you go right, you go to a place called Long Beach. If you go left, eventually you're going to wind up in Gilgo Beach. So, you know, it's it kind of intrigued me because it was something I did for a living, uh, you know, looking at these cases, trying to build upon them. And and just to quite, you know, frankly, that it's, it's, it's in your backyard. And, uh, and the other thing is, you know, I ended up now, we didn't know at the time, but, you know, we we between Wantor and there's a town, Seaford, and the next town would be Massapequa and Massapequa Park. It was on the same train line. So we used to do, so it was actually pretty close when you think about it. Yeah. So sorry, you guys, I didn't even give you a recap of the case. I hope you guys are up to speed. We are talking about the Gilgo Beach murders, the Long Island serial killer case. If you don't know anything about this case, there's a link to my playlist in the description box. And there's also a little case background if you just want to quickly read that because we've done lots of deep dives on this case. And of course, head over to Joe's channel because he's spoken a lot about this case as well. So that's why we're here today to pick his brain. <laughs> wow. So do you think that he could have been caught sooner? Yes, absolutely. He could have been caught sooner. But when it, this case is actually um, a, a good learning lesson. And it's something that I've written about and something I've talked about. Nine times out of 10, the answers that you have to your case are somewhere in the case file. And sometimes you need to have that fresh set of eyes to come in and find it, right? And I, when I tell my students this all the time, like if you if you write an essay or a term paper, you give it to somebody like your mom or your brother, you sister to read it, you think it's perfect. And all of a sudden they give it back to you and all these things are circled and stuff like that because you don't see your own mistakes. And listen, you know, detectives and you know are human too. They tend to make mistakes. It's up to either the supervisors or another detective to find them. And when you find them, you know, you can correct them and try to, you know, push the case forward. And th there is this New York State investigator. We All we know about, th about this individual is that it's a female investigator. But she's the one that really broke this case wide open by identifying that, uh, you know, the, the green avalanche in the case file and then putting this all together between the license plates and the pings and the registrations and then putting this all together based on the descriptions that they had. So one day we'll find out who she is and then uh, she deserves the medal on this one. Right, and do you think that the guy who called in the tip about the green avalanche deserves the reward? Well, I mean, it's it's something that definitely needs to be considered. So, you know, the way Crime Stoppers works is if you give information that leads to an arrest and a conviction in some of these big cases that they're entitled to the reward. Uh, this individual should be entitled to at least the initial reward that was put out. Uh, you know, this thing has grown uh, to be a, a huge amount. So, yeah, yes, I mean, if they get a conviction on them, I think he deserves to get the money. Yeah. And the biggest question, which is on my thumbnail, <laughs> do you think, because now Rex Hureman has just been charged with the fourth murder, so he's officially charged with the Gilgo Four murders. Do you think that he, and it's just speculation in your opinion, do you think he's responsible for the other murders or would be linked to them? Or do you think there's a possibility of more killers using the same area as their, sorry guys, I know we don't like this word, but like as their dumping grounds? Well, from the very beginning of this case, I was on the on the public record doing interviews and stuff like that, that before we even heard the name Rex Sherman, that I believe it was one killer. And the reason why I thought it was one killer was because it is such a remote location, Gilgo Beach. You had to know that this place even existed. That's the first thing. The second thing is that this was an individual, as far as I was concerned, that that developed his M.O., so to speak, 
based on new technology, right? We've seen serial killers in the past develop, you know, about learning different things about how to avoid law enforcement. But this case I thought was going to be a little different because if you remember, uh, the, the first couple of victims that they found were found dismembered. And they had, there was a reason for that. These were women that he picked up off the street where somebody could have recognized him or identified his vehicle. I mean, when you, we learn now, right, we have, we're talking about an individual with an unusual big truck and we're talking about a very big man. And there could have been a reason why he was so careful back then. And he, that's the reason why that those women had to be dismembered because he didn't want the police to identify him. And he made a great effort to do so because we find different pieces all over Long Island. It's not like they were within 10 or 15 feet. He tried to make a, this individual tried to make a huge effort in order to make sure that these women were never identified. So that was the first, that was the first part of it. And the second part becomes the technological issue where he learns now that he can use things like burner phones and the internet to pick the girls up there. He doesn't have to put himself out in the public in order for somebody to be able to like, see him or identify him. And, you know, and also in, in my um, theory so far, well, let's call it that, you know, he stayed away from places like hotels and motels because of the surveillance that goes on in some of those things. And, and that's how he's kept himself going that long, pretty much. So why do you think that he was Googling John Petrov? Because that, I know your episode on that was also very interesting and in seeing the court dates that he had and then that was canceled or something or postponed. Why do you right. think Rex Human was researching that other serial killer? Right, so here we go. So this is John Bitroff, and I, was, I, I told me if you want to look him up, it's two T's and two F's. He's got a very, very difficult name to spell. But just a quick background on him. He's a carpenter from Long Island who was accused of killing three women, but they convicted him of killing two. Uh, Rita Tangredi and uh, Maureen, oh boy, McNamee, sorry. Yeah, Maureen McNamee. So, Colleen McNamee, sorry about that. So, he, he had these women, right? They were, they were found, their bodies were found in a, in a location that was pretty remote. There wasn't really any building or anything going on. It was pretty, now it's houses and stuff like that because we're talking about the early 1990s. And so he doesn't match the quote unquote definition of a serial killer as part of the FBI because they only got him for two. And the issue that comes down to is, are those cases uh, regarding Rex, right? Was Rex saying like, well, those are my things. I'm, that's my responsibility, right? Somebody else is getting credit for it. So that's the thing. Now, there is a big push by Bitroff's uh, attorney to have this case be put in what's called a 440 motion to have it vacated. Uh, the district attorney has said that they're trying to get it vacated because they didn't get all the evidence, right? So through the Brady material. But you have to, when you start looking th into this thing, talk about a rabbit hole to go down. This case, uh, you're dealing with a situation where there were, where the victims had a few, a, well, I don't I say several, but there was more than one donor of genetic material. So that leaves the whole speculation window wide open about who else's DNA could have been discovered. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with cases like this, you don't know whose DNA came first, second, or third, so to speak. And you, when, you, when you're dealing with sex workers, this is, a, this is another issue that you have to deal with, that you have multiple donors uh, at a time when somebody's body has been found. It's unfortunate, and it actually hurts your case, too. Yeah, sure. But that, that was interesting that, in your opinion, Rex could have been the dismemberer and then moved on, like, changed his MO slightly. So what do you think? Do you think that he stopped between 2010 and 2013? Sorry, 2010 and 2023. What do you, do you think there's more there? Because I can't imagine that it just stopped. Right. Well, this is they, look, as one thing we, we have learned about serial killers is that there is a cool off period. Right. But 13 years or so or almost 13 years is a very long time that he was around doing things. Uh, it was it was ironic because one I had made a tweet saying that where he lives, there's a there's a huge area uh, that that should be looked at. And it, there is a, I mean, when you're talking about similarities between Gilgo, except for that there's no ocean, but there is a, a huge wooded area between his house that leads all the way up to something called the Bethpage State Park. And we're talking about thousands of acres that is that is not lived in. And, and it's right around the corner from his house. 
And I said, that should, you know, I said, I would be looking into that. And then the next thing you know, everybody in the world, I'm getting media inquiries from everybody saying, well, why do you think mm -hmm. so? I'm like, have you ever been there? Because if you've been there, like I have, I, there's a bike path, there's all kinds of stuff. But in the summertime, you can't see more than five feet outside of that bike path. It's very thick. So law enforcement didn't take me up on my offer. They probably weren't happy that I brought that up either because <laughs> it's a really vast area to, to have to search. But I think it would have been worth it. I don't know if you saw what your video on that inspired on my channel because I literally <laughs> I fired up my flight simulator <laughs> and I actually flew over it. I flew from his house and I showed all the grizzlies. So grizzlies, if you haven't seen that, it's on the playlist, right? We flew over that area because I'm like, oh my word, there's this huge area right there. So we flew up and down and looked at the area, just you know, aerial view on a flight simulator. But I think you have a good point. And I do hope they search yeah. more there because you just never know. Yeah. Well, you know, unfortunately, not just in this case, but we've seen it in other serial cases where law enforcement kind of like puts up their hands after a while. It's like, OK, let's just, you know, you know, if we don't look, we don't you don't have to you know, be worried about additional cases. Because remember, each body you find goes against that the police department in regards to, you know, how many cases that they have on Suff. Now, that would have been Nassau County's uh, backyard. So that would have been under their jurisdiction, not Suffolk's jurisdiction. So they would have had to have gotten permission from Nassau. And that's what would have given it to them if they asked, I'm sure. But it would have had to been a joint operation for sure. Yeah. And Becky says, do you think he might have hidden evidence in his projects as an architect? Well, that, you know, that could be an interesting aspect of it. But he was building, you know, the uh, this kind of the city building, the skyscraper stuff, not homes. And that, you know, we could have excavated for basements and stuff like that. But listen, anything's possible, right? One thing I learned in my career, you never say never, never say always, because God, I've, I've seen stuff where you just, you shake your head and you wouldn't believe it. So like, if you told me, gee, if you said, listen, Joe, there's a pink elephant in the lobby, I said, okay, let's go see it. You know, that's, that's the kind of <laughs> attitude I have on things now. I, I don't discount anything what anybody could say or any ideas because some crazy stuff has happened for sure. Yeah, you just never know. Priestley says, have they searched where Rex went hunting? I don't know if you saw those reports. I'm sure you did of where he went hunting in Alaska, like bear hunting. And he had all these guns in his house. So do you think it's possible that if he's a serial killer, because right now he's innocent or proven guilty, if he turns out to be the serial killer, do you think it could actually be nationwide or further that he well, operated? Here's the interesting part on that right so if we think that he could just be confined to long island and he would only do things on long island i think we would be you know selling ourselves short and from the investigative community so yes he there needs to be a look everywhere he's lived or spent a lot of time and then you know one of the things one of the stories that we kind of never heard the answer to the end of it was las vegas las vegas had uh, basically you know sued new york state to get the dna sample so that they can test it to the cases that they had now they finally got it but then, you know, basically radio silence on it. We haven't really heard any updates on that. I know sometimes these these uh, checks from, from CODIS takes a while, right? It's not like TV where you close a 30-year case in 45 minutes with three commercials. It's um, it, it's it t sometimes could take a little while. But I, I think that's something that I, I'd like to get an update on and, and see that. But if that happens, so wherever, if, if they can attribute anybody to him outside of New York State, now we're looking at a federal case, and I, I could tell you from experience, the FBI is always watching. They're always over your shoulder looking over these things. And listen, it's unlike television. If the FBI wants to come in and take it and I was doing this, I'd be like, here you go, right? It's it just you still get the credit for it, right? So it still gets closed at the local level. You still get the credit for it. But, um, you know, that, that would be an interesting thing because then the death penalty is on the table. And that, that could be a game changer for identifying other victims or other places or other people because now you have a bargaining tool, right? At this point, you don't have that. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Lorraine says, you are a very great detail-seeking person, Lieutenant Joe. Yes, he is. Let me I got show a promotion. You. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you got a promotion. <laughs> so, you guys, if you haven't subscribed to uh, Joe's channel yet, please go over there. Let's see where we're at now. Can we get him to 6K immediately? Come on, okay? I know you don't want to leave the stream, and I don't want you to either, but quickly, subscribe. <laughs> Come back. Or or subscribe the after, okay? Make sure you do. You don't want to miss out on Joe's amazing community posts as well. He does, um, look, 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 I got this one right. <laughs> I do all the quizzes, right? He's always got quizzes up for us. You're going to learn so much over there. 
So go and subscribe over there. All right. So yeah, there's a bonus now. quiz today too. I usually do the I usually do the quizzes Monday through Friday, but every now and then I'll throw a bonus one there. So there's a Saturday bonus question coming up. So excited. So that's coming up later. Yeah, four o'clock. They usually post. That's the time where uh, YouTube tells me to post things. So that's where nice, I nice. Okay, we're well, excited. I hope you guys stuff. go there and see if you get the answers right. If you get it wrong, don't worry. You can pick another answer. <laughs> I know because I'm learning so much over there. I'm like, am I an A student there or not? Not, not so much yet. I'm learning, you guys. So I hope that you'll participate there as well. Thank you. Our web says I'm subscribed, and T and Wildflower says I love the quizzes. And also, if I'm missing any questions, I'm really sorry. I do want to tell you guys though, please go and ask the questions on Joe's channel. You know, maybe he'll answer them over there. You're frozen now. You look like you're taking a nap. <laughs> okay, there you are. <laughs> it was nap time <laughs> for Joe for a second there. You're back. And you're back with us. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your theory on the Route 29 stalker, because I saw your episode on that. Like, could Rex Herman be the Route 29 stalker? Right. So the Route 29 stalker case came about because one of the victim's um, this. children came forward and, and, and put out a thing and said, hey, the drawing and the sketches of uh, this guy looks a lot like the Long Island serial killer suspect. I mean, and when you look at it, I mean, the... the um, it's uncanny, right? So the, you got to remember too that these sketches were actually done along the side of a road, right? So it's it's one of the things that the that some of these victims uh, supposedly happened to them is that their car breaks down on the side of the road, and then this person comes to help them out, and that's and then all of a sudden we never see this person again. The car's still there, but they're gone. So we don't know if they say, "Hey, come on, I'll take you, I'll give you a ride into town, or what have you," and then they, they don't find the people anymore. So this description actually comes from people driving by it. You know, how, how fast could they be going, right? 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. So to get a sketch like that is actually kind of amazing. And you take a look at it. You know, is it him? I don't know, right? We don't we don't know for sure. But it's definitely worth a deeper dive for law enforcement to take a look at it uh, and, and to see if, um, if there is anything. Maybe some of the victims that they do have, you know, are there is there DNA that can be uh, tested? All right, these are these all the new genetics and all the new things right there. I mean, look at it; it's, it's uncanny. It really is. I'm trying to put them side by side here so people can see. Just uh, sorry, guys. I know the screen's a little bit small here, but uh, just to show you, once you put it next to each other like this, like oh man, look at this. And it, didn't his mother live on that route? I think they said that he used to drive to visit his mother on that Route 29. Something like that. Yeah, it's um, th th there are some, let's put it this way, coincidences, right? And one thing that law enforcement, you know, we don't believe in coincidences, right? So when people say, oh, it's just a coincidence. In our line of work, there's no such thing, right? So this is like, you know, it's, it, I'll give you an example, like Wendy Adelson driving to the crime scene, you know, uh, or accidentally going to the liquor store and driving through the crime scene, right? Those <laughs> things just don't happen, right? I mean, it's just... It's just kind of like, you know, you raise your eyebrow and you kind of look at it. But then, you know, from law enforcement perspective, you have to prove all this stuff. So it's good mm -hmm. to have this kind of inquisitive mind, but you also be able to have to build up an evidence and build a case against somebody. So just to say that's him or he looks like him. No, that's all you got. I mean, you, have, you need the evidence in order to be able to prove it. You've teased before that you might be covering the Delphi case. And I honestly can't wait for you to get into that rabbit hole because of all the coincidences there as well. It gets pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, that case right now has taken some wild turns. So I, I definitely wanted to take a deeper dive. I was in Indiana a few months ago for a sort of poll case symposium that I was invited to speak with at Purdue University. And I had an extra day kind of like to yourself. And I'm sure you've been to some of these things where if you're not going to have to be on the stage or answer some stuff. So you have to do a little sightseeing. And unfortunately, my sightseeing involved going to uh, the Monon High Bridge and, and looking for the, you know, at all the different locations where this guy lived and worked and just you know i put a little video together on that trip just to give people like a bird's eye view kind of thing but i wanted to get a lot deeper into this case but then all of a sudden the things kind of went off the rails right where you know he's put into this maximum security prison odinism stuff uh, you know cultish religion stuff uh, sacrificial uh, and so i, I kind of stepped back from it because couple of things I try not to get involved in. I try not to get involved in too much of the speculation, too much of the crazy stuff. So I've taken uh, kind of a backseat on that as I'm waiting to see that whole mess develop and see what happens. Because 
listen, I don't like what I've what I'm hearing or what I'm seeing. Just too many questions have uh, now ar- arisen from this, specifically with Judge Gull and uh, you know firing the lawyers. I, some crazy stuff, but hopefully things you know get a little more rational, and I li- and I like to take a deeper dive. Yes, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I know I'm excited, so I'm sure many Grizzlies are as well. Lorraine says, yes, please cover the Delphi case, Joe. So I guess the the case itself and the coincidences surrounding, surrounding that and some of the persons of interest that we initially raised that, like Kagan Klein, all that would be interesting <laughs> for you to deep dive, minus all yes. the legal battles going yeah. on. My goodness. Yeah, okay, it's tough, so, as you know, to, to tune out the noise sometimes, right? So uh, you, you've done this now a lot longer than I have in regards to doing the, uh, you know, the, 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 the video cast. And, and tuning out the noise sometimes is is difficult because there's so many different things coming at you uh and like like quite frankly i mean listen i know how the legal system works i know what the judges do but a lot of the stuff now is legal battles that's really for lawyers to, to to discuss and to try to make sense of it that's why you know bob mod has been great because yeah. he's been breaking it down for you know for everybody in, in basically you know layman's terms <laughs> so that kind of yes. helps out a lot so it helps you know, a lot defense diaries, so, yeah. oh <laughs> yes my God, defense yeah. diaries yeah because like i said <laughs> very I, easy <laughs> yeah we, we we can't yeah we can't um you know pretend to know everything right so we need to have all these other experts coming in and chiming in and, and making sense mm-hmm. of things that are just absolutely wild right now yes so you guys subscribe over there. You might hear about Delphi at some point. <laughs> so now back to uh, yes. the Long Island serial killer case. I guess we should call it the Gilgo Beach murders case, right? Do you think Rex is the Long Island serial killer? Is that, you know, we don't like to give them cool names, but I'm just saying he hasn't been charged with the others. We don't know if he will be. I think in your opinion, you think he might be, right? So yeah, Liz, right. is he the Long Island serial killer? Well, I think, you know, even with the four from Gilgo, I think calling him the Long Island serial killer is probably... Uh, you know, a pretty good moniker right now to, to try to deal with this. Uh, you know, there's there are some cases that were initially outliers, right? So you had the Manorville cases uh, where those bodies were, were found um, dismembered, but then they found the rest of their remains in Gilgo, right? So when you start to see this, that's why I'd say, you know, you don't believe in coincidences, right? So you, when you found those bodies years ago in Manorville, which that person was dubbed the Manorville Butcher, you know, then all of a sudden you find their remains, like Jessica Taylor's remains in Gilgo. And now all of a sudden everything gets tied together. So it's it's really important. There's there's one case out of this whole group that if I was doing this, uh, I would be really focused on. And that case would be Peaches. Yeah. And the reason why I say Peaches and Peaches is, is also the mother of baby doe that was found in Gilgo too, which was found pretty far from where her mother was found in a place called the Hempstead Lake State Park. Hempstead Lake State Park is another pretty vast location in Nassau County. It's uh, just above like Rockville Center and Freeport area, for those of you that might know or want to look it up. And, you know, her remains were found in a container that was on the side of uh, a walking path. And the reason why I would like, uh, this is the case that I'd be focusing in on, is because the body was found contained in this kind of cooler like it could be like a rubbermaid thing i don't know they they haven't really specified but there was a blanket in there there was some tape and stuff found in there and one thing that we're learning over the years is that hair follicles can get attached to these things blood other body fluids and things like that and it was closed the container so everything that you could imagine was left in there is was still in there when it was found so that's the one i think that gives me hope they, in my opinion, they've already identified her because the um, the Mobile Police Department in down in Alabama kind of made a boo boo. <laughs> they <laughs> they put out uh, they, the FBI is looking for help to try to identify this this person, and they gave and they put the picture of Peach's tattoo without naming her or the case or anything about Long Island. But it was kind of picked up pretty quickly that uh, this was Peach's, and then the FBI was on top of that. So, and that was over two years ago. So. If if we think that they haven't identified them yet, I think we're I think that's been a little silly. Right. So, do you think that could be one of the upcoming announcements that Peaches has been identified? Uh, it it could be absolutely. I think um, the, not only Peaches, but you have uh, Asian male uh, Doe, and of course, if you, once you identify Peaches, you get the baby Doe. So it's I think that a lot of people focus on the baby and Peaches because of the fact that. This, you know, the baby, this is talk about horrific crime where you just left this child out there in the middle of 
of nowhere, um, you know, to, to, to die, basically. We don't know if, if the baby was dead before they put him there or just left him there to see if maybe somebody finds him. Who knows? But talk about – give you a little insight on the person that, that did this boy. You know, talk about uh, depraved indifference to life. And I think that's why, too, that, that this case would be a focus of mine, too, because of her child, what happened to her. Yeah, well, keep us posted <laughs> if you learn anything new. And if you guys want to see those, keep us posted. It's on Joe's channel. His YouTube channel, the links are being shared in the chat, and it's also in the description box and also on my community tab. Also, I missed a question that Annie P asked saying, what are Joe's thoughts about the tension between the DA and John Ray? Have we lost ground since the change in leadership? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. All right. So how, wh whatever people think about John Ray, right? There's a lot of people that love John Ray, a lot of people that don't like John Ray. I've known John Ray for a long time. Uh, I've interviewed him many times on my channel, but even before that for the radio and in person, uh, he's a very nice, he's a very nice man. And he is really the guy responsible for keeping this case alive in the media when nobody was talking about it. I mean, when I say nobody was talking about, it, you know, the Newsday, which is the local paper, would was due basically, you know, on the anniversary dates and say, hey, it's been five years since anything has happened and nothing's going on. And then they move on to, you know, some cooking show. But the, the issue that comes down to is that he really kept that case of Shannon Gilbert in the media which all automatically focused in on Gilgo and all the other remains of all the other victims, which unfortunately, gee whiz, you know, like they, it seems to be forgotten, right? That these are real people. These were individuals that had lives and family. And yes, you know, they fall on hard times, but that doesn't make them bad people, right? I mean, it's not like these people were responsible for something heinous and, you know, kind of like, okay, you know, this, this is what happens. But you know, they really didn't. They, they, you know, they're victims in this whole thing. And and victimized in so many different ways and, and we kind of forget about that so you have to give john ray credit for that because he never dropped that torch for these for, for shannon and for many of the other girls so that's the first thing but the the, the thing about uh what over the years so tom spoda was the district attorney that was involved in this investigation from the beginning and we all know what happened to him right he ended up in federal prison as well as his um his uh, McPartland, who was like his right hand man, so to speak, he ended up in federal prison all over James Burke going to federal prison for beating the suspect um, who actually just got arrested again uh, for, for an unrelated charge. But, mm -hmm. you know, we, we know that there's been issues with Tom Spoda and some of these uh, cases that they that they've had. So John Ray never got any play with the police department back then nor the district attorney. John Ray only became a focus of part of this investigation when Rodney Harrison took the reins of the Suffolk County Police Department. He's really been the only public official that's taken him serious in a lot of the aspects because John has done a really a tremendous amount of work finding people. Over the years, he's brought uh, in sex workers that have made certain statements. I mean, remember, I was trying to explain to people if he's bringing somebody out and they are willing to come on either TV or like you saw at the symposium in public, you know, they have everything to lose and nothing to gain. And that's, that's something that really needs to be examined, right? Because if somebody's trying to do something, they just like, Oh, they want attention. They want money. They want this. They want that. These individuals come out with, come out with this information and all they do is get bashed in the media, get bashed online uh, and, and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's something that needs to be taken serious. And the, the new district attorney, Ray Tierney has done an awesome job, but I, I think we start going back to the days of um, John just being ignored, uh, not only by the district attorney, but by, you know, just about everybody in the media, which there's a big difference, though, this year, you know, in 2024 than in, in 2010, and that's the Internet and true crime and shows like yourself or, you know, even mine a little bit in that respect, where these things don't just die anymore. Right. They can keep on going on and being spoken about. And John's made the rounds. So he still has a voice, which is which is much better than it was, you know, 13 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah, he does. And he really I mean, as you say, he kept the case alive for many year many years just and he's still doing so the, yep. the one point where i disagree with him on is where he says that um asa elarab and rex's daughter are in the circle of suspicion or should be but 
the daughter was like age 10 to 13. <laughs> yeah. So I, in my opinion, I don't think the daughter should be in the circle of suspicion. I think she should be protected. If people want to look at the wife, I understand that because we, you know, like I give her the benefit of the doubt, but I understand why, because there are cases when sometimes there would be a wife involved or, you know, under the curse of control of the guy. And But shame, the daughter, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that, but everything else, it's very interesting. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And, you know, in regards to the the evidence and the hairs and stuff like that, this, the things that John had said too that I, I don't agree with, and that's one of them, right? The, the, the um, you know, even if Asa knew about certain things, I mean, there could be a strong argument that she's a victim of domestic violence herself, right? Where she's frightened, psychologically damaged, and and we've seen this happen where people, the other spouse or significant other, just goes along with the program because they fear for their own safety, and, and not only the fear of physical harm, but also being cut off financially, right? So that's like the kind of yeah. the double story when you're dealing with domestic violence, right? Where somebody not only is physically abused and psychologically abused, but the financial abuse is important to think about too, in certain respects. And, you know, we we, we know about the, um, the Peacock deal and many of us, including myself, find it distasteful, but we do know that money is an issue with, with, with Asa. And, you know, once again, kind of, saying, you know, kind of almost doubling down on what I said before about being financially abused too. But so, yeah, I don't agree with John on, on that respect because I'm still a firm believer in the transfer evidence. I do believe that um, the homicides also didn't happen in his house. I mean, we've all, even if you didn't live or, li or know about Long Island, everybody has saw it, right? Where they have 10 days of search warrants and videos running 24 hours a day at that location. It's a very small knit community. The houses are on top of one another. And there is very little, um, let's put it this way, there are very few secrets you can keep in some of these Long Island neighborhoods. And, you know, I, I've stared at the house. I have looked at it. I've done, and I'm still trying to figure out where I could see Karen Vagata poking out of a window or where I could <laughs> see, you know, somebody, yeah, somebody running naked around and nobody knowing about it or how someone could start a fire in the backyard and, and not one neighbor saying, oh, yeah, he's starting fires in the backyard in the middle of the night, right? So there are some questions. I'm not saying that this couldn't have happened, but there are things that I find difficult to um, comprehend or, or see how it plays out. But I can always be shown, right? If you can show me the evidence, I'm okay, I'm okay. Then I'm, I'm okay with it. I can come around to it. But right now, I'm a little skeptical on some of the stuff. And what are your personal thoughts on what happened to Shannon Gilbert? Because do you think it was a homicide or something else? Yeah. Well, I, the, once again, in the beginning, I don't believe in coincidences either, right? So Shannon Gilbert's case, I find it very difficult to believe that the, the, that the events are happened the way they have. I've been out to the crime scenes. Uh, I've visited them all. I've I've photographed and videoed them all. And then, you know, like you do, you go to the maps and you look at some of these things. That, let me tell you something. I wouldn't want to just walk through that thick brush. Uh, first of all, I get poison ivy just by looking at it, right? So that's, that's the first stuff. So I wouldn't even go in there on a bet. So if you said, hey, Joe, I'll give you $100 to walk through there, I say, you can keep it. But not only that, I mean, the... the I would like to have known a lot more about the remains. I mean, I know there's some skeletal remains, but the clothes were found in one place. The phone was, you know, found in another place. Um, I, I look at it too, no matter how uh, somebody is, you know, and I've seen people who are or who are high or having, you know, breakdowns, you know, take the, remove their clothes. I've seen that. But, you know, running through this, running through this woods, and I, I don't care. I mean, you'd have to be really intoxicated in order to not feel those thorn bushes and everything else scratching at your body and doing all this other stuff. I, I still find it difficult to believe. And I'd be, listen, the medical examiner only said the manner of death was undetermined. It didn't say it was an accidental death. The police department is saying that, which I have a, I have a problem with. That's not the job of the police department to say it's an accident, case closed. No, they need to provide the evidence to prove that it was an accident to the medical examiner so that he or she can change the death certificate. Right now, it's still carried as undetermined. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, with her earring being found in the driveway and a jacket and the jeans and the phone and all these shady characters around that case as well, the question would be, because there's much speculation, of course, I know you don't like speculation too much, but do you think Rex Hureman is in any way involved in Shannon Gilbert's case or the group 
of guys in that uh, pool are persons of interest. Yeah, I don't think Rex would be individually involved in Shannon's case per se, right? That doesn't mean that there isn't a, I, 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 I used this word once and I got myself in trouble, but I'm going to use it again anyway, because I know it just drives people crazy. <laughs> a, a cabal of men that were involved in Oak Beach doing certain things with women and stuff like that, that are just probably either, you know, saved for those, uh, you know, dark alley talks. But that you know, there has there's been a reluctance um, in regards to you know, the initial investigations about how far they went to, to go into Oak Beach and, and really examine what was going on here. But purely from an ins investigative point of view, I think one of the biggest mistakes that were made from the very beginning of the Shannon Gilbert case was not securing the video surveillance at the booth that night that she disappeared. To me, that that's kind of unforgivable. That's investigation 101. And, um, you know, and quite frankly, I don't think they've been grilled enough on that situation because that's a big piece missing. And it could have explained a lot, right? It, it could have had, the video could be showing Shannon running into the, into the thicket all by herself, which could have put all of this to rest, right? But by not having it, we'll never know. And then that's why conspiracy theories and all that other stuff live on. Right. And police departments need to learn that too. do the job right the first time, because if you don't, this is what you get. Yes, absolutely. I mean, her 911 call was very strange and disturbing. She said very strange things. There were noises in the background. It's not so. Yeah. All the theories are not born out of nowhere in this case. Right. It's, you know, it's not connecting dots where they're not really there. It's a very, very strange case. So right. I really hope that at some point that gets solved as well. Yeah. Well, just from the, the, the victim object, standpoint, the right? I mean, yes. Yeah, yeah, but from the victim standpoint too, right? So, Shannon, without Shannon Gilbert, um, you don't have a long Allen serial killer case. So, exactly. you know, that's I mean, it, that's that's something that I, I've said, you know, a very long time ago, because without her, there is no cadaver dogs doing, you know, quote unquote training in Gilgo, right? Because that's that's what it was the, you know the dog went for a little. Uh, to relieve himself and then found, you know, what we now know as the Gilgo Four, right? So, you know, in, in regards to Suffolk County Police Department, yes, in, in the beginning it was maligned very badly, but you know what? They had those cadaver dogs out there, you know, looking for, you know, Shannon Gilbert, and they ended up finding and stumbling upon, however you want to look at it, uh, the, the initial what we now know as the Gilgo Four. And, you know, this, this, I mean, we could pick apart the investigation all day long. It's always, you know, it's always easy to Monday morning quarterback these things, right? A lot yeah, of people, yeah. you know, can do that, you know. Um, but like I said, if you, if you, you only get one chance to do it right. And when you don't do it, this is what happens. Yeah. I mean, you make a good point about the video. Was it Dr. Peter Hackett in charge of that video? I mean, he's quite a red flag. That one inserted himself yes. in the case in an interesting way <laughs> yeah there's so many questions that we don't know the answers to and this is where and, and i kind of left that out in, you know on purpose because we know that john there is a lawsuit against um you know peter hackett from john ray there's a, it's still going on and and john actually um uh, he kind of got lost over but he made a statement that he the day he did the press conference with uh Rodney Harrison by his side, then police commissioner. He said that he took affidavits from Joe Brewer that day. And kind of people kind of like overbridged that. And I actually, when I spoke to John again, I did, did, did I, did I hear you right? Did you say you took a, a, a deposition from Joe Brewer that day? And he said, yes. Now Joe Brewer was the person that had hired Shannon Gilbert. If uh, people who don't remember or didn't know. So to me, that was another little interesting tidbit. And uh, I watch press conferences very carefully, especially when the police department is talking, because they give a lot of clues about what's going on. And I always tell people, you say, you know, Joe, do you think, you know, that that they there's only one killer or there's only one thing, or how do they know they got the right person? I say, when the police department doesn't say, listen, batten down the hatches, lock your doors, keep the kids inside. If they're not saying that, they are very confident. They already know who this individual is, or they already have the individual and know where, you know, and don't worry about those things so that's something people need to keep in mind be very cognizant of what people sometimes are not saying in these press conferences that's true we recently learned that with that manhunt of the colorado lady who's suspected of murdering her children and then fleeing to the uk 
But at the time, we were like, where are the flyers? Because the, you know, the FBI was looking for and the police, everyone was looking for, but where's like flyers information? <laughs> so we're wondering, you know, like maybe they already know where she is. And just a few days later, they're like, she's in the UK. So it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's about what they're not saying as well. So yeah, hopefully when we have more press conferences coming up, you can share your thoughts with us here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I do that a lot, you know, like, and then sometimes I do this when I do it on television too. And they'll ask me flat out, you know, do you think they, you know, they got the right guy? And I'll just say, yes. And just on a, uh, not to go off on a tangent, but when I was on um, Law and Crime Network and they asked me, you know, it was during the Brian Kohlberger thing, he said, do you think that the police have suspects? And I said, the day before the arrest happened, I said, yes. And the reason why I said yes was because they had the interview with the chief who was sitting back in his chair and he had his, he had his hands up and he was talking to the press. And, he had his, and I said, that, that, that's a man who is not worried about anything. That's a, that's a man who's just waiting to get the phone call and saying, we got him. And, you know, and lo and behold, the next day is the, the arrest was made on that. So yeah, nonverbal cues, you have to be really cognizant of them too, because they tell you an awful lot. Remember, actions speak louder than words. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's a good point you make there as well. <laughs> I'm sitting like that. Also, Lieutenant Peter Pranzo, Harlem Raiders is in the house too. And you recently interviewed him hey, on your channel too. So if you guys want to go check it out, you yep. can go check it out there on Joe Jackalone's YouTube channel, which is the Nightbot and the mods are sharing for us. So go and subscribe over there. So congratulations. You're over 6,000 subscribers now. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank <laughs> you very, very much, everybody. Very exciting. Very exciting. Grizzlies <laughs> go is, there. That yeah, is I'm a go new make some milestone. comments. Go yeah, go check out Peter Pranzo's interview there. And also, welcome to everyone from your crew as well. Maybe there's some new people here. I see Catch Lisk is here. It's so nice. Always an honor to have you yep. here with us. Um, you've done yeah, some Raul's excellent good work. good people. Yeah, yeah. So really always making sure people remember it's about the victims and their families. You know, yes. not Yeah, we sometimes forget monster. that. Or it kind of gets glossed over, right? And and Raul's been always there to kind of remind me of that too, right? So, you know, yeah, it's, it's all about this and all about that. But remember, at the end of the day, it's about these uh, individuals who are no longer here. Yes, there's, it's there's easier yep. too. <laughs> yep. It's so nice to see your crew here as well. I hope that you guys are subscribed over here too. <laughs> We, uh, we got Definitely. Grizzlies, we got uh, the Sarge in the house, so this is a great day. I don't want to see if I asked you everything that I wanted to ask you, and then Grizzlies, keep on asking your questions. We've still got a little bit of time. Um, oh, will sure. you attend I the trial? I'm in no rush. Yeah, are you going to attend the trial whenever it happens? It might be a while. Well, the, the problem with that is, like, for instance, New York has uh, no video cameras in the room kind of thing. And now that Rodney's gone, right, he was going to be my ace in the hole to get in maybe to behind the scenes, whatever. So uh, the chances of me now just being Joe Nobody is probably zero because uh, I, I probably haven't made too many friends out there in, in the Suffolk County government either. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And not that I'm worried about that. I was never worried about, um, you know, wrinkling feathers or ruffling feathers, so to speak. Um, you know, people have asked me for my honest opinion, G, and then never spoke to me again. So it's just kind of, you know, so when people ask me, hey, Joe, what do you think? I tell them, go ask somebody else. The last guy doesn't talk to me anymore. So it's, it, it, uh, it kind of is what it is. But I'm going to see if, what you know, if there's going to be access and then how to get on that access. Yeah, that'll be amazing. Then you could maybe take some notes <laughs> and report back. Yeah, because, yeah, no saying. cameras, no, no cameras. videos, no phones. Yeah, no nothing. No Twitter. They're, they're knocking out social media stuff. Uh, they're going to be doing a big thing. You know, I think I guess the only ones with cameras and they will be Peacock. <laughs> so, who, who exactly. knows? They're going to be there. <laughs> they will definitely be there <laughs> with the who's arriving and who's leaving and all of that. It's actually like it's when people want to hate game. on. It is, right? When they want to hate on Asa, right? They're projecting a lot of uh, like, why is she doing this and accepting the deal? But like, what about the company? Why are they, that's a little soon. Why are they doing that? You know, yeah. this deal that they've made with her. Like, what are you trying to do at this point? <laughs> Well, I, I try to explain to people, listen, you, you, you can, you don't have to like it, right? I mean, we're not, we, there's no one saying that you have to like this idea. I don't particularly like it, but you, you don't like this, the saying go, you don't hate the player, you hate the game. And the game is, exactly. like I said, is Peacock. You know, if they're going to offer that kind of money, I, I, I don't think there's too many people that would turn this down. But I still think this uh, documentary is a bad idea because... Boy, oh boy, if you make a, an off-the-mic comment or you say something or do something that um, that could implicate you, boy, there is no immunity clause in the world that you took before that that's going to prevent somebody from, from prosecuting you. And if you don't think the minute that that 
that whole thing is done, that the district attorney isn't going to ask for every B-roll, everything that get made the cutting room floor and everything. I, I think people are really sadly mistaken if they think that they're not going to get that material. And they will, and they'll go over it like a fine tooth comb. Just ask Durst how that worked out for him, right? Making that hot mic <laughs> comment for his way was a Netflix, you know, special that went with him behind bars the rest of his life, which was which was a shorter time, but still, you know. Yeah. Not a good idea, guys. Not advisable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not advisable also, at all. I don't know why you're talking about that. Remind me of this. But what do you think of um, Rex Human writing back to the happy face killer, Keith Jesperson? <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I've, I've learned about that, too, is, uh, you know, I, I look at the writing because the, the statement analysis part of things are really important from reading people who, you know, make confessions and that kind of stuff. There's no denying it. Right. So if you're if I'm in prison and you are a serial killer, and you send me any a letter saying that, hey, man, just take the plea, whatever. I'd be like, I didn't do any of this. I'm not taking any plea. And you can stop writing to me, right? That's not what it was. It's like, I don't have butter for my bagel or whatever. I, I'm not getting this. I'm not getting that. Uh, you know, so, you know, there's there's some other weird stuff happening with the Jesperson guy too, right? And his daughter and the, and the yes. GoFundMe with, uh, with Asa. And, it, it's after a while, like I say, you, you just kind of shake your head because every one of these big cases now are getting taken over by some fringe element and, you know, <laughs> injecting themselves into this thing. And it's just, it becomes bizarre. It really does. Here we know, go with the just, butter again. <laughs> yeah, here we go with the butter. <laughs> oh, man. But do you think, and people asked when, when he said, like, okay, so if you guys didn't follow that episode, um, Rex Yerman wrote back to Keith Jesperson, the happy face killer. And in the letter, he asked, do you get butter on your bread? Well, I don't know if he said bagel bread, but do you get butter? Now, people thought that was maybe code between uh, one alleged serial killer and an, a convicted one. But do you think it's code or literally meaning do you get butter? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's literally do you get butter. And I, I said bagel on purpose because that's a big Long Island thing, right? So bagels are you. Oh, yeah. oh, well, you get your bacon, egg, and cheese on, a, on an everything bagel. That's basically uh, a Long Island thing. But, yeah, I don't know what kind of bread it actually, he's actually talking about. Probably just a slice of white bread. But uh, I guess in, in, in jail or prison, uh, butter can be used to certain things like, you know, loosening up things and, and that kind of stuff. So they probably don't serve it for that reason. Yeah, it really doesn't help his case to be writing back to another serial killer. <laughs> yeah, no. I guess, well, yeah, if you notice, I, I don't think that you'll ever see a follow-up on any of that, too, because I think once uh, Michael Brown heard about this, I think that would end it. <laughs> oh, <know>? yeah. <laughs> he, Mike, Michael Brown's got a tough enough job ahead of him as it is. He doesn't need to have any more uh, kind of things piled onto him, that's for sure. And he does a good job. Snarky lawyer. We, <laughs> we like that. Feisty. <laughs> Ready to defend his client. He's like, he's saying he's innocent. We're like, okay. Not to keep Jesperson, yeah, well, though. I mean, that's what he gets paid to do, right? That's what, yeah. You know, that's what he, that's what he's, that's what his job is, right? Like I said, I don't hate defense attorneys. People say, well, I'm like, oh, no. not like, No, they, they have a job to do, right? I mean, it, and people are going to be like, I can't believe he said that. You know, how does he say that? <laughs> that's his job, right? I mean, he's not going to come out and say, yeah, my guy's guilty. Throw away the key. I mean, jeez. I know for you and I, Defense Diaries made a huge difference <laughs> to how we perceive defense attorneys. <laughs> I saw you share that on a live stream. Oh, absolutely. I say that to Bob all the time. <laughs> so you've done some excellent yeah, even work. Then, like, like, even, oh, you know, yeah. Yeah, even cases that I've had, you know, and, and you know who the defense attorneys are and they, and they try to make you look bad, whatever this and that. It's like the, um, you know, it's like the cartoon with the with the sheepdog and the coyote where they're trying to kill each other for the five minutes in the movie and then they clock out at the end of the day like, okay, Bob, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. But, and that's basically how the courtroom group works. I mean, yeah. they're just doing their jobs. This would be such a good trial if they could stream it, you know, but they're not going to. It would be so, so entertaining to watch it with the attorneys so would... and sure. Yeah, it would be. Good. Let me see if I have any other yeah. questions for you. And then let me just see. We already spoke about all those things. Baby dough and peaches. Okay. So I think I've asked, I've, uh, asked all my questions. Yeah, you guys are saying, lawyer, you know, Peter too. And he's dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. So do you guys have any questions well, for Joe right now? Yes. Well, as, as we're waiting it, yeah. for that, I mean... Yeah, well, as we're waiting for other people's questions, I mean, there is something that really needs to be, uh, some attention needs to be brought about. You know, will this case be moving forward now that we don't have Rodney Harrison at the wheel? So we don't know much about the new police commissioner, Warren. Uh, we have not heard any public statements about this. We haven't heard any public statements about the Long Island serial killer 
updates from the new elected officials, which kind of worries me a little bit in re- in regards to this. And, you know, just to use like a football analogy, basically, you know, Rodney Harrison handed the football out at the goal line, and now it's just up to these individuals to carry it over. And just because you have the arrest on the Gilgo Four, that doesn't mean your case is over. There are still several other bodies and remains that have not been attached to anybody yet. So the they need to keep the task force together. They need to continue doing making that effort between the city police department, the Nassau police department, uh, Suffolk, the state police, the um, you know, and everybody else, the FBI, of course, and anybody else who's been involved in this, because. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done, and the case doesn't rent end with an arrest. They have to carry this thing through prosecution. They need to be up to date on this case when they go to court. They're going to be deposed. They're going to have to have all this information. The district attorney, as far as I'm concerned, has laid out the DNA evidence that is very difficult. It's going to be very difficult. And I tell this to my kids. They said, you know, he, when he gives that that number, one in seven point nine trillion, that this DNA could be somebody else's, right? Uh, just yeah. goes to show you, and I tell people, what's the odds of winning the lotto? The, the odds of winning the lotto are one in 300 million. So think about that between one in 300 million or one in 7.9 trillion. You have the better chance of winning the lotto 10 times over before you can even be considered somebody else's DNA. So he's got, Michael Brown's got a tough hill to climb. He does indeed. And there could be so many more victims. It's not just even about the bodies that they did find. What about all this, the other ones that they may not have found? It could be, like, if you had to guess, because people always ask me this as well, if you had to guess, if Rex Herman is a serial killer, how many victims do you think he's had in his lifetime? Okay. Yeah, that, that's a tough thing to put a number on. I mean, Raul has been uh, mapping all these things out. And I think tomorrow, for those that live on Long Island or if you read it online, Newsday is putting out a a complete spread on every missing persons case that they they have on Long Island still. So I think, you know, uh, other people, including Newsday, are are actually kind of like, you know, thinking, you know, could some of these cases be attributed to Rex or whomever, right? You know, that kind of thing. And I think it's a good thing, but I, I think it took a little bit too long for that kind of information to finally come out in the public. You know, it should have come out years ago. Yeah, probably. Um, Stefan has got a question saying, do you think that Herman committed earlier murders between 1990 and 2007? Well, there's a good possibility of that, right? I mean, you know, serial killers, they usually start in their early 20s kind of thing, uh, which would put him, you know, even a little bit older uh, at that point. So, you know, unfortunately, we we won't know for sure unless he confesses to certain things. And right now there's there's no leverage on him to confess to any of these things. I mean, even the Karen Vagata case, uh, even if this woman or the, the, the retired detective who I asked Rodney about, you know, on the interview on my show, and he said, we found him, we've, uh, we've interviewed him a number of times. You know, even if they say, yeah, this was Karen Vagata, uh, they're still gotta. They're still going to need evidence to go into court because if you go into court uh, with just a single ID witness on a case like this, New York State won't even you know, the, the prosecutors won't even look at it because it's it's nearly impossible to to get a conviction on a, on a single ID witness. It's as simple as that. Right. And do you think that Rex Herman would ever just confess or plead guilty? Unless, unless the feds take over and the, you know, and they said they had some leverage on them saying that we're going to, you know, you're going to get the death penalty now. Other than that, and we've seen this happen with other people like uh, Ted Bundy, right? As soon as he got sentenced to death, all of a sudden, then he would, you know, string investigators along. We've seen this with BTK, where every now and then he gives out something and just because it, it just keeps that date if they, if they get it, you know, further out or keeps them relevant and that kind of thing. Um, like I said, at this point, I don't think he has anything to just, you know, to, to force him into doing it. He, he's got nothing to, he's got nothing to gain by it. Yeah. And have you heard the, the, let's say research on it, but let's say the theory or speculation about Rex Herman's cousin and what he may be involved with. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff coming out about the, um, this is the, the, the religious guy, right? The pastor or whatever yeah. he was. Yeah. Um, you know, there's also been rumors about his brother and stuff like that. I mean, like, once again, I, I'm an evidence guy. I'm going to, you know, I have to, I'm going to have to see the evidence. We're going to have to be able to prove this. 
we're going to, and that's another reason why I kind of stayed away from that part of the story, even on my show is because, you know, it's, it's really just speculative now and you, you can't project just because the, this guy is, you know, doing whatever, that doesn't mean he's done all these other things or he's related to this guy. So he's got to be included into that. There is, there's got to be a real deep dive into that. And it's just something to, um, you know, we keep an eye on, keep it on the back burner, but uh, I would avoid, you know, kind of getting speculative into that one. Which would be the same answer for his brother, perhaps, right? Thoughts on the brother? Yeah, well, we, we do know. Well, one thing we do know is about his brother is that he's not a very nice guy, right? I mean, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's um, yeah, he's, even if you remember, even Asa, right? When this thing first broke, she was not very nice either. So that didn't help her out in the very, you know, screaming at people off her porch. I, listen, I can understand that there's a lot of stuff that was happening to her, or whatever, but I don't think she did herself any favors starting <laughs> off uh, with that too, right? So that's something to first to, impressions to last <laughs> that first impression wasn't great <laughs> yeah it wasn't it was not good yeah yeah not that i'm trying to falter with it it's just like oh no now that's what everyone saw <laughs> first and they remember it and, and they do they remember it and they hold that against you and that's and that's yeah. something you know that's that's why you don't get a second chance at those things and then mm -hmm. adding the peacock deal onto that now they already had a reason to dislike her now all of a sudden you added this now it's like you know pile on everything um you know, listen, if the police find evidence on her, they're going to charge her eventually. Like, a lot of people like are, are really nuts about this. If they had the evidence that she was involved in this by now, she'd already be in cuffs. But, you know, it doesn't exist yet. And if it does exist, trust me, they will they will do it. Yep. Also, I missed a question earlier. Um, I, um, our whip said, I don't understand why they took the avalanche from South Carolina but didn't search the property. Do you know if there was a search warrant there or not? Well, I, yeah, we don't. We haven't heard anything about a search warrant per se. In order to get a search warrant, this was a quiz question not too long ago. You, the police need to establish probable <laughs> cause, right? So remember, this is on the brother's property. They have no evidence that the brother is involved in any of this stuff, and I don't think a judge would give them a search warrant. The truck? Absolutely. Right. Because the truck was previously owned by Rex. So I think that was a no brainer. So I think that's why they took the truck and kind of skedaddled after that, because that's all they legally, that's all they could. Have. They could ask. Right. You can always ask somebody, hey, listen, can I search your property? But we saw how he was dealing with the media. I don't think he was really probably nice with the cops either. So, uh, you know, you can always try to get consent, but I'm not a big fan of consent because if something happens, the person could say I was coerced into doing it. And now you have a whole other issue. And I'm, a, I'm a firm believer on if you think that there is something that is going to be provided in your case, get the search warrant. Right. We have a saying in policing, when in doubt, fill it out. And that's basically what you're dealing with in that respect. So no on that property, you couldn't establish. Probable cause, yes, on the truck, and that's why they got it. And I'm still shocked that this truck still existed because I think that's where these crimes were actually committed, where he, where he goes on a quote-unquote date in the truck, uh, overpowers the victim, and then drives the victim out to the dump site and, and leaves their body there. Um, I don't know if you saw the little videos I did on him. You know, people like, oh, he did one on a boat. There's no way he did this by boat. Zero. <laughs> I'm glad you say that. And my opinion is also not that it's by boat. I think he's a little too lazy for yeah. that, in my opinion, from what, what I know about him. Just that that's the perfect dark road with that marsh right there to do what he did. And and it looks a hundred times different today than it did back then. So today they have lights out there now. They've actually uh you can't drive on the, the shoulder anymore. They made bike lanes, and, you know, so all the crime scenes are basically gone. You can't see them anymore for what it used to look like. But back when this thing first, the place was pitch black. You couldn't see anything in front of you. And, and, and there's a good example of it in, uh, you know, Josh Seaman's killing season where they pull over to the side of the road and <laughs> you can't see your hands in front of you. It was perfect cover, but you really had to know that that place existed. It wasn't like you can make a turn off the highway and all, all of a sudden you're there. You have to you had to travel to get there. Uh, sometimes, like you know, depend on the Sunken Meadow Parkway, which is, by the way, the way up to Manorville too, which is maybe another connection there, where you, you're talking about you're going over bridges for maybe you know 15, 20 minutes. So it's it's not like like oh, I just discovered it. You had to know that that place existed. Yeah. So you also maybe think he went from his house eastward and across that long bridge. That's what I was. People first drew the map and traveled west from his house. 
But that's like through well, all residential areas. If he went east over that bridge, that's a lot of darkness. It, well, there's there's two ways that he could have gone. Uh, the one I mentioned earlier, the Wanto State Parkway, which is much closer to Massapequa. But if he, like for instance, if he is responsible for the Manorville cases, the Sunken Meadow Parkway right there will take you right into the um, Robert Moses Causeway. And then you go, you make the, basically you're making the, the right going west. And as soon as you come off the sunken meadow, the first, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a sign. That's where the first body was found on, on one of the, I guess the original Jane Doe was found right there. So if somebody had just come off the parkway, boom, and then took off. But mm -hmm. like, for instance, the Jones Beach ones, you just come right down the Wanto Parkway and you could have, you know, he could have done just make the U-turn. There's a U-turn. There's a couple of U-turns on um, Ocean Parkway. The, the other thing is too that you know, it, it, not that it's groundbreaking, but every victim was found on the north side of Ocean Parkway, except for Shannon Gilbert. She was found on the south side. Um, yes. Like I said, that's not groundbreaking, and that's something that's you know. But it's I, I think it's because it has to do with the travel route. The person comes right down on the parkway. He doesn't have to make U-turns. Doesn't have to do anything. Just drops the bodies and continues to the Wanto Parkway. Go right up to Massapequa. It's as easy as that. It's a circle or an oval. Exactly. Yeah. We've done some map time, guys. If you want to check that out, we've flown it. <laughs> we've driven it with a Google man all the way here from, from Europe. The Google man. We've been there. <laughs> you know, the little Google man put him on the ground, walked around. This is nice. Still get out. Uh, G and Joe, giants in true crime. That's sweet. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. Uh, also, Tiff Knox asked earlier about the storage units. Why do you think there was, I think there was a yeah. medical examiner there. Right, that must be interesting. What do you think they could have found in there? Well, yeah, that's well. Let's put it this way. So, just just I'll answer that question, but I'll just just take a little quick side note. When we were doing things like a dig uh, for a cold case, or we were doing something where we believed that there was human remains found, we would put the team together, including the medical examiner and anthropologist, right, to tell us if this is human or animal, or the bones that you find. We would have had all those people on the scene already. Now. Yes, in New York City, our resources and people were much greater, so they have a you know a lot more people. But in Suffolk, in a situation like this, I still think that the medical examiner should have been there at the initial stages of this because you don't know what you're going to find. So having to call the medical examiner to the scene, there's only one reason why you call the medical examiner to the scene. I mean, it's you know, do you, you do you find something that could be potentially biological or human, you know, remains. I mean, that's basically what you're looking at there. And, and once again, they did themselves really no favor in not having that individual there because nobody would have asked the question if the ME would have then went inside the storage facility to look because they were there from the beginning. So it's just a note, not only for Suffolk, but other police departments too. If you're doing something like this, have the team on site. This way you can just knock down some of the speculation right off the bat. But yes, <laughs> That's a good I'm, point. <laughs> I'm very interested in, yeah, I'm very interested in that. So here's another little tidbit for those that are really good at finding information out. New York State has, when you do a search warrant, they have something called the search warrant return, which is, a, which is a, an additional form that's attached to the initial search warrant. Once you're done with the search warrant, that goes back to the court that issued it and it has a list of everything you took. So that's a public document and eventually that's going to show up so that's that would be another little interesting and, and i think a treasure trove of what we're looking at not only in the house but the storage facility and it's something that i am anticipating because that's you know some big stuff i mean you saw the 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 tub right where they cut out the whole section people are like why did they do that well if they mm -hmm. think that a body was cut up there you know the blood and everything else drips down goes through the you know the the, the cork or goes through the grout and seeps in behind the walls. And that's the reason why they took it apart. And, you know, to me, I saw that. And that's the first thing I said. I said, oh, they think that something happened in that tub. So, you know, did they have information and, and evidence? I, we don't know yet, right? So there's a lot of unanswered questions. But I could tell you, when you watch uh, the district attorney, he's kind of, I, I wouldn't say smug, but he's got that, um, he's got a look of like, we got this thing, you know, he's, he's very confident would be a, not smug confident. I think would be a yes, much yes. better adjective to use. I, I like the district attorney. I think he's done a pretty good job. I think that he's taken a big chance, of course, uh, doing the case himself, but yeah. you know, there might be bigger, bigger political aspirations down the road because <laughs> he'll get it based on this for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Probably, yes. So that's what I'm saying, man. I wish we could see the trial. That would be so interesting to see the confident uh, district attorney and then, sure, Rex Yerman's attorney. Wow. <laughs> this actually, uh, just one opinion said, I believe he killed at the house. And earlier you said you do not believe that he would have committed the murders at the house. So rather in yeah. the vehicle, in your opinion, right? But yeah, would he I have mean, listen, taken... any, anything's possible. Right? Yeah, Do you think he would have then taken trophies and, of sorts to the house? Because they definitely dug up that house. I know they have to be sure, but man, they dug up the yard and everything. Well, I, and I think that's a good move, right? Because once you have the scene, right, you do everything you have to do. The reason why I still don't believe that it was done at the house, almost the same reasons why I don't believe he used the boat. There's just too much movement. You're bringing somebody home. You're doing something terrible to them. There's a chance that they can escape or scream or something happens. Now you have to remove this individual and put them on your truck, right? So there's extra steps, and he's been very precautious. And I think uh, that you that he stayed away from doing that at the house because, like I tell my students, if you ever try to make a milkshake and the top of the blender comes off and the milkshake goes everywhere, and you clean it up, you think you got it all right, and then six months later you're pulling down dishes, and all of a sudden you find chocolate milk on it, right? So. <laughs> This is an individual, I think, that based on his Google searches too, right? We only know some of them, but he's interested in about what's going on in certain investigations, and he's interested. In, of course, he's got a whole bunch of other stuff that's that's bizarre that that his attorney is trying to tell us. Well, look at your, uh, you know, search records, and then you know, basically, cares judgment on my guy. Hey, you know what? You can look at mine. There's nothing on there like that. I can tell you that. I mean, jeez, <laughs> right, right, yeah. Wow, right. So some of the stuff is beyond disturbing. We won't repeat it because they'll. YouTube will ban you, but you know, the issue that, that you're dealing with. Yeah. But it's, it's uh, definitely something that is um, really intriguing to me what those search warrants have. And like I said, that's going to be a, a hell of a press conference day when they finally release that stuff. Yes. Imagine that. Um, so I guess some people would think that he might've committed the murders at the house because apparently his wife and kids were not home at the time, but I get what you're saying that the risk <laughs> Although he seems to, based on his profile, even though he's innocent to proven guilty, like risk. But uh, also yeah. following on that, yeah, sorry, I want to hear your thoughts on that, yes? No, so, you know, listen, doing what he's doing is already taking a risk, right? Dealing with sex workers and stuff like that. There's different levels of it, though, right? So, you know, when you start graduating into murder, right, there's there's a much now bigger risk and identifying, listen, if he, if he, as a husband or, or anybody, he gets caught with a prostitute, or whatever, the worst he's looking at is his wife divorces him and they move on to something else, right? He gets embarrassed. He ends up in the newspaper. But once you get to this stage, it's no longer embarrassment kind of thing. You're going to jail the rest of your life. You could be facing the death penalty. I mean, the stakes are much higher. So yeah, yeah, there's different kinds of levels of risk, but also, like I said, just take a look at how close other houses are to that. And, and listen, I grew up on Long Island. I spent you know, almost my whole life there, very nosy people. I mean, there are the, people involved <laughs> in everybody's business over there. So, yeah. And if you notice, when they were out on the crime scene doing the searches, whatever, they didn't have a parade of people coming up to them and telling people, oh, yeah, I saw this or I saw that. Or, that guy, I always knew he was there. None of that happened, right? None of that happened. So, oh, I saw a parade of girls going through his house. Nobody said anything like that. And he had a golden opportunity for what was it, like 11 days and it didn't happen. So that's that's kind of, I think, leads more towards nothing happened at that house. Just me. I could be wrong. Okay. And listen, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been wrong before. That's for sure. But um, I'm going <laughs> to go with my gut yeah. on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow your gut. Um, Kat said Google searches were the worst. Asian male, mm -hmm. he was definitely looking for news on his own crime. Yeah, the Google searches were really rough. So if you guys didn't see it, we did read through the entire PCA before and everything. Don't you think that there's yeah. a possibility there could be like child cases with him based on what he was researching, like missing children or something like that? Well, it could be. I mean, he seems to like a particular type of individual, right? Short female, you know, uh, in that regards. The, the the Asian male opens up another kind of um, thing because we see his Google searches, right? He he made a couple of references to, you know, what the guy's gender was and, and preferences were and, and everything like that. So, you know, that could be another case where, you know, we might hear more from down the road because of the, basically his Google searches based on one of the victims that were found, I think, 
I think we're kidding ourselves if investigators didn't, you know, didn't shoot up a red flag saying we have a victim that matches this and we have all these Google searches. Is this somebody that could be attributed to him? That would be something that investigators would definitely be looking at. So yeah, cat is, you know, it's a good call on that one. Exactly. Honestly, I could talk to you all day. I don't know, well, I'll say all night for me because it's already quarter past nine. <laughs> for you, it's day. I'd love to have you back on the show. I have to go prepare Anytime. now for my pat my Patreon only live stream. So if you are a patron, you guys on uh, if mods, if you want to share the Patreon link so people know what it is, or you can go to my website. We're gonna have our very first um, Patreon only live stream in forty five minutes from now. So you got to find the link on the Patreon post. Okay, don't share the link. <laughs> so I will see you there soon. <laughs> Joe, thank you so much for being here with us. I want to show them again your channel. So this is Joe's channel, Joseph Jackalone. Am I saying it right, by the way? Jackalone, right? Yes, you are. Yep. <laughs> I should have checked before. <laughs> Joe Jackalone. And I've got all the links to Joe's website, to his Facebook. Um, to he, He's a professor, you guys, from the at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which is why I love to participate in his quizzes, because it feels like, okay, I'm a student now. <laughs> We're studying with Joe. And then also... If you want to grab uh, some of Joe's books, the link is also in the description box and on my community tab. So is this the one you'd recommend getting first for everyone? Yeah, that's that's the, the, the newest book. It's different than the criminal investigation book. Yeah, the criminal investigation book walks you through how to do a complete investigation. This here is specifically about what a lot of people on the true crime world do on, on, uh, on a daily basis. And I think it would help them, you know, put together some of their stories or put together some of their, you know, videos in a, in a um, more reasonable fashion in respect that there's timelines there's different things and there's and it's actually some tips about what people can do with actually to find information that's open source yeah have you seen this by the way someone put this on x the other day i think they said it's interesting <laughs> your book yeah. frequently brought together and down the hill you see you got to talk delphi soon <laughs> this is a delphi yeah. related book so it's interesting that people buy these two together Yes, and I think it's because of all the stuff that's going on about delphi yes, that people yes. think that this thing's going to go belly up <laughs> Mm hmm. Yeah. So if you guys want to check this out, as I say, all links are there. Let's see how many how many Grizzlies went over there. Have you guys gone over there? You better go over there after the stream if you haven't yet. So, OK, you're at 6.15K subscribers. Wow. Let's get that to 10. <laughs> that would be amazing. So, yeah, and I'm very excited to see all the content that you make. I love all your YouTube shorts and all your quizzes and live streams and all the guests you have on. So um, how can people support your work? Do you have, um, you know, like a, like a buy me a coffee or a. Or is it just like, do you want them to buy the books or what? Well, I mean, listen, I know sometimes, yeah, the people, you know, there's money, you know, there's sometimes people have money issues and stuff like that. I mean, you, the best way you can support is just like and share the videos. And and if you want, you know, subscribing, of course, that all, that's all support, right? So um, it's just something that I do. I'm enjoying doing this. And, and if people want to join as a membership, they can do that too. I only have one level of membership. I'm just, uh, you know, just chugging along and I'm just using the money to buy new equipment and, and try to make these things better for everybody. So they enjoy it. Yeah. And you're doing a great job. I got gifted a membership. Thank yes. You. Recently. <laughs> so that was so great on your channel. <laughs> um, so if you guys want to go there and interact in the live streams, maybe you'll get a gifted membership there. Unfortunately, the feature is not on my channel. It's not available to every creator or every country. So I don't have gifted memberships here. I'm sorry, guys. But go oh. over there because you could win one over there, <laughs> which I did. So do you have another member stream coming up soon or? Yes, uh, tomorrow I have Haiti Chance, who is the part of uh, the Ar Arizona Attorney General office. Uh, she's a former Phoenix police officer. She's going to talk about some of the issues that we're dealing with in regarding trafficking and those kind of things. Uh, and because Long Island just had a big expose on this about how Long Island is at the top of the list of some of these uh, issues. So we're going to try to tie all that in. Of course, mention the Gilgo stuff and everything else that goes along with it. But it's a, it's it's definitely going to be a victim centric day tomorrow, and that's at three p.m. Eastern time. But that's a public stream, right? Not members only. Right, that's so public stream. Channel. Yes. Yeah, public stream. So okay, so you guys go go and click notify me. I'll show you how to do that. Look, you just go to it and you click notify me, huh? <laughs> and then it will tell you. And then I'll hopefully be there in chat tomorrow. It's at nine p.m. my time, so that should be a good time for me as well, time zone wise. Works out. Works out. Okay. So again, thank you so very much for being here. I hope that you'll read the Anytime. comments. I'm sure people will leave some nice comments for you as well. And please go and leave some comments on Joe's channel too. And then we'll chat to you again very soon and hopefully one day about Delphi. <laughs> Absolutely.
Okay, bye everyone. I'll see all your patrons soon and members. I'll see you guys very soon too. And everyone else, don't worry. I'll see you soon too. I'm always making stuff for you, okay? <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you, mods. <laughs>